What's going on guys? Welcome back to Hashtag AskGSM here today, episode 191 for July 26, 2017. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. Before we get started with today's episode, just want to say this real quickly. Check out our last two great episodes of Hashtag, the last two awesome installments with Jason and John, respectively. Two weeks ago, Jason. Last week, John. Check them out if you haven't already. They're two great guests. Always enjoy having those guys on. Uh, speaking of whom... Hoping to get them back on the show for episode 200 coming up. Uh, I know it's episode 191 here today. We'll focus on that for the right here and the right now. Um, but episode 200 is quickly approaching. We are nine weeks out, and if my calculations are correct, it's going to land on Tuesday, September 27th, or that last Tuesday of September, whatever that might be. Let me check my calendar right now. The 26th, excuse me. So we'll get to that when we get to that, but I'm still tweaking out the plans and you know, early ideas for episode 200. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. It's either going to be having Tom, John, Jason, and RJ come on, not simultaneously, but maybe in different segments we have them on. Uh, obviously the four, really the only four guests we've had here on the show, Haley hardly counts. She barely even spoke in the episode she appeared on two months ago. But um, we'll work on that as it gets closer. Maybe it's a live episode. Maybe we do our first ever live edition of hashtag ask GSM right here on YouTube because I can do a YouTube live I might have yet to do it so um, that would be pretty monumental as well so let me know what your ideas are whether we have all four guests on again maybe not at the same time I'd have to do them either over the phone or in person whatever so that would be pretty much impossible to get them all in the same place at one time but maybe you have them on in different chunks and different segments or we do it live Whatever you guys want to do, let me know, but uh, that is back in September. That's not going to be for another two more months. Let's focus on the right here and the right now uh, for this week in the world of WWE. But what a week! We go from having one of the worst pay-per-views in recent memory with Battleground on Sunday to having two great episodes of Raw and SmackDown, respectively, on Monday and Tuesday. What a week, really. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, we'll get started here. Before we get started, if you want to send in any questions for the show, be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, and I will say this. I put up the post last night, but not until like 11 o'clock because I forgot. So we have no Facebook questions this week, so I do apologize to the Facebook folks, but I will put it up a lot earlier next week. Fingers crossed. And uh, last but not least... Drop a question on this very video. I'll include it in next week's edition. So let's get started here. Um, I have like just about three pages of questions, not three full pages, two full pages, and then like half a question on the third page. So it looked like we had a lot of YouTube questions this week. It looked like it was a lot more than it actually was, maybe without the Facebook questions. It's, you know, around like two and a half pages, which is what it usually is. But no complaints. So the more I love more questions, don't get me wrong. But the more questions we have, the longer the show goes. And that sometimes can be a good or bad thing, depending on who you are. Anyway, though, let's get started here. Captain Sunshine from YouTube. What if AJ Styles' next gimmick is trying to convince everyone that the Earth is flat? Then he feuds with Shinsuke Nakamura, who argues that the Earth is actually a cube. Hashtag bookie. You know, everyone's asking right now, how do we get to AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura at SummerSlam or preferably WrestleMania? You booked it right there, Captain. You booked it right there. AJ Styles talks about how the Earth is flat, and then Nakamura comes in saying that the Earth is a cube, and there's your build. That's that's all you really need. Uh, their next question, has there ever been a gimmick more dead on arrival since Mike Kanellis? I swear I have not seen a character more DOA since Crush led a biker gang. Yeah, you're quite right there. I mean, I like the gimmick. I'm actually, I actually don't hate it as much as many other people do. Um, it is, I don't want to call it a dead end. They can make it work. What doesn't help, however, is the fact they've already booked him to lose twice. And I know someone else asked about this. I think it might have been at Rusty Rages. I'll get to his question later on towards the end of the episode. But for right now, though, yeah, the gimmick doesn't really do him any favors. I'm not really sure, and I talked about this with John when I saw him last week. I don't know if we talked about it on the show. I doubt it. But, um, you know, I was saying to him how we were watching parts of SmackDown from that week. And I was telling him how I like Mike Kanellis, Mike Bennett, whatever. And I loved his work in TNA. His Ring of Honor work was good, too. Um, in TNA, it was really, really good. And for the people now... And, I mean, I guess I'll get to it later on, so I'll talk about... I'll hold off on that until later, my thoughts on Mike Kanellis. But, um, in, in terms of fan response and stuff like that. But, in regards to the gimmick, yeah, just... 
really, I mean, it's it's kind of a stupid gimmick, I agree, but they couldn't make it work if the booking wasn't so horrid. I mean, I know he's only lost twice, he's not buried in the water, but the guy got pinned in a tag team match, also involving fucking eating English. Why wouldn't they have English get pinned? That was my big question on Tuesday, or last night, whatever. But, um, yeah, they, they could make it work, they're just not doing him any favors. Um, I thought, really, that, what I was trying to get at when I was talking to John last week, he had mentioned, he had brought up the fact that why don't they just do the miracle gimmick they were doing in TNA? Which I completely agree with. They're kind of sort of doing it, not really. The only okay, I'll, I'll say this: the only real thing that's similar between Mike Kanellis and Mike Bennett from TNA is that, or really, not nothing about him is similar. It's Maria, who still calls herself the first lady of instead of professional wrestling, it's first lady of SmackDown Live. They can't say that you know p the the, the pro wrestling word. Uh, it's it's a dirty word in WWE. But um, other than that, the gimmick is completely different. But I love the Miracle gimmick. I mean, it was kind of hokey early on, but I don't know. I enjoy it. I think that's a lot better than the love thing. But I'll get more to that later on because someone else asked a question about that as well. There are a third question. Should Jinder Mahal just change his finisher to him holding up a sign that says, Help me. The guy has practically wrestled the handicap matches since his uh, sudden push. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that either. All the interference in all of his fucking matches. Literally every single one. He cannot beat a single person clean. Um, you know, I, I know that that's done to elicit heel heat, but that really should have stopped on Sunday. I mean, if you wanted to have the great colleague come out, that was kind of dumb anyway. That was really, really dumb, actually. But the Singh brothers coming out, and they, one of them took a hell of a bump, and I love the Singh brothers. I think they're a great addition to his act. But literally having them interfere in every single one of his matches is a bit ridiculous. It's very predictable. And it does, Ginger Mahal, it doesn't do anyone any favors. Because the matches are st still super boring. And then adding the interference on top of that, it's a, just a very predictable deal. So, um, yeah, I, I really hope, not that they should get rid of the Singh brothers. Again, I think they're a great addition to his act. But having them interfere in every single match, like Jesus Christ, the whole point of the Punjabi prison was to eliminate interference. And they had interference anyway. So, that was one of my big gripes of that match on Sunday, despite the fact that it sucked. Um, but yeah, you have this giant prison and the whole purpose is to eliminate interference and the guy is coming anyway. They literally crawl through the fucking cage. Like, what was the point? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of that either. Frank Ashier 15, also from YouTube, which pay-per-view was worse? The first Battleground from 2013 or the most recent Battleground? That's a great question. I've talked about this before. I did a whole video a few months ago here on YouTube for my random video blog. My top five, I think it was top seven, least favorite WWE pay-per-views in the time that I have been a fan. Fastlane from this year was on it. Battleground 2013 did not lead the list, but it was up there. Uh, Survivor Series 2013, I think, was number one. Undoubtedly number one. That pay-per-view fucking sucked. Uh, but this one, yeah, it's really hard to say because that first Battleground, and I've said it time and time and time again, that that was the first pay-per-view. Pre-network, by the way. Pre-WWE Network. So why anyone would pay 50, 60 bucks for a show like that is beyond me. You're wasting your money. Um, but anyway, like 50, 60 bucks. $10, whatever. It's all free. Blah, blah, blah. Spending 50, 60 bucks on a show like Battleground 2013, you should be ashamed. But anyway. Or your parents' money. So when that pay-per-view came around, long story short, and I've said this before, that was the first pay-per-view in, I think, three and a half years. I did not watch live. Um, I had other stuff going on, just homework, which is important, don't get me wrong, but literally, like, every other time I had homework, like, I have missed book projects to watch WrestleMania, <laughs> like, and I had to catch up the next day. Not something I advise for students in high school and college, but I've done it. I have not studied for tests to watch, like, WWE pay-per-views and stuff, and then I would cram afterwards. That's just the life I lived. Or I would do it during while I was watching the pay-per-views, during the shows themselves. Um, but for Battleground, I'm thinking, okay, I have homework tonight, I can either do homework, or do it after I watch the pay-per-view, and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna do homework, and that, that's a pretty big deal, when I choose homework over watching a WWE pay-per-view, and I watched it the next day, and I felt like I wasted three hours of my life, aside from Cody and Goldust versus The Shield. Now, that brings me to my next point, that show, it was, the show sucked, it was terrible, but... It was terrible because it was just really, really boring. And the ending to the main event also sucked too. It was Orton and Brian who were having a fine match. Nothing too special. It was okay. And then fucking Big Show comes in, knocks both guys out, and we have a no contest finish to our main event on a pay-per-view. That was a slap in the face. 
that was really, really dumb. I know they wanted to carry on the whole Obey in WWE story, uh, you know, the whole Obey in WWE title storyline, but to end a pay-per-view like that, that was really stupid. That was really, really dumb. But the rest of the show is really just kind of dull. It wasn't terrible. Like, Punk and Ryback was mediocre at best. Um, that was right before Punk left the company, a few months before he left the company, actually. But the whole show sucked. Um, but besides the main event and that atrocious ending, there wasn't really, like, a truly terrible match on that show. Battleground 2017, however, uh, a lot like Battleground 2013, where the build sucked and the a majority of the pay-per-view was really, really dull, and you had one great match, which was the tag team match. In Battleground 2017, it was Usos A New Day. 2013, you had the Rhodes Brothers and The Shield. Now, if I had to choose, I would absolutely any day of the week go with the Rhodes Brothers and The Shield. Because that was not only the best match of the night, but one of the best matches all year. And we're talking 2013 year. You know, 2013 was not a great year for WWE, in my opinion. You know, from a in-ring storyline standpoint, whatever. So, that match was great. And nothing else was really that bad. It was just a really, really dull show. A show that sucked, but it was really, really dull. This show had a really good match. Not quite as good as that tag title. It wasn't even tag titles. Uh, as quite as good as the Rhodes Brothers Shield match from four years ago. In addition to that, you had the two top main events that were awful. Like, nothing on Battleground 2013 was nearly as bad as that flag match I saw on Sunday. Or the main event between Orton and Mahal. So I'm going to have to go with Battleground 2017. I think that was the worst pay-per-view of the two, in my opinion. Uh, his next question, after watching Battleground, it seems to me that Vince is trying to ruin SmackDown and bury it. Does it seem true? Does that seem true? Or is it just an overreaction? He's not intentionally trying to bury SmackDown. I'm not sure what changed. I'm not sure if the writers from SmackDown got moved over to Raw and the Superstar Shakeup, which also did a number on SmackDown a number of months ago, um, back in April. But SmackDown, in their sudden change in quality, I mean, like I said, Tuesday's show was great, but overall, the blue brand is not as hot as it was like a year ago, or even six months ago. Uh, six months ago. It's, I know, like, Mahal, it doesn't start and stop with him. He's a big problem as to why SmackDown isn't as good as it once was, because he's just not delivering as WWE champion the way that he should. If he was a mid-card guy, that'd be another question, but the fact the guy's the fucking WWE champion and the show revolves around him is not good, because he's not that good. But there's many other issues with SmackDown beyond who's the WWE champion. Um, so again, I don't think Vince like is like, oh man, they're saying SmackDown's better than Raw. Let's let's crush SmackDown. Like, that's not the case. Because SmackDown was doing far better than Raw for not like a month or two, but for I would say until the brand split started, up until like WrestleMania. And then after WrestleMania with the superstar shakeup, that's when things kind of got even. Or I would even say Raw's been better than SmackDown as of late. I mean, I think this week. Uh, both brands had great shows, but more often than not, as of late, Raw has been the better show, in my opinion. So I will say that uh, I don't think he's trying to bury SmackDown, because if he is, then he would have done it six months ago. He would have done it a year ago. He would have done it from the outset, instead of waiting until after WrestleMania. So yeah, that is a bit of an overreaction, and SmackDown isn't ruined, and it's far better now than it was even uh, you know two years ago, when we had no brand split, and the show is completely meaningless. But uh, it is a bit of an overreaction, but I will agree that SmackDown is not what it once was. Next question. Speaking of Vince, I just read a rumor that he was unhappy with New Day appearing on Talking Smack before they debuted on SmackDown, which I can somewhat see why he was mad. But doesn't he book the Who's on the Talking Smack shows? I think he does. I'm pretty sure Vince gets the final say on not, ha not only what happens on Raw and SmackDown, but also what happens on these kind of shows. Like... I'm sure with 205 Live and Talking Smack, he's not overseeing every little creative decision. But obviously he has a say, and he gets the final say on whatever happens on any WWE show. So yeah, that logic is dumb. I did read that report as well that not the only reason why they canceled Talking Smack, but he was mad that uh, New Day was on the show. Oh, they debuted on SmackDown before they actually arrived on the Tuesday show. Uh, but they showed up on Talking Smack first, which was so fucking stupid. Um, I didn't see it that way. I didn't see it as, oh my god, they debuted on Talking Smack first, so that ruined their SmackDown debut. Who cares? Who fucking cares? You know, that was really something dumb to get mad about, if true. But, um, yeah, he, he does book who's on the show. So whoever started that rumor or that report, which I think was from Dave Meltzer, who's usually accurate or has, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, he has some sort of, uh, 
you know, obviously a source in the company that gives him information or he's the source of information or whatever. Um, I thought that was, now that you break it down like that, it is a pretty dumb rumor. It's pretty silly. And his next question here, what would you grade Jinder Mahal's title reign so far based on matches and promos? So if you take into consideration the presentation of Jinder and how he's come across, I would boost the grade a bit because he does look like a star. I mean, it looks like he's on fucking roids and the back knees gross. But beyond that, the guy looks like he should be a WWE champion. Unfortunately, once he steps in the ring and he's got a mic in his hand or the bell rings, the magic ends there because the guy's not that very good. He's mediocre or best, like I said earlier. He's not terrible. He's just a very bland and average performer. He just does nothing for me, and uh, which would be fine. Again, kind of pushing it with the U.S. title picture, but as WWE champion is just... It's not working. The guy is just not working as WWE champion in my eyes. So, if you want me to grade his title run, purely based off of matches and promos, I gotta give it a D. I'm sorry. Like, maybe with the presentation, I would boost it up to a C- minus or even a C, because the Singh brothers are great, like I said earlier. I'm a big fan of those guys, and I think they add a lot to his act, and I'm saying a lot. Like, I, the only reason I may enjoy Jinder is because of those guys and the bumps they take, and I think they're awesome. You take them out of the equation, and you're only talking about matches and promos, which we talked about earlier, only has fucking, like, interference. Interference in every single Jinder Mahal match, and the promos are the same shit. Like, everything Jinder does is so cookie-cutter and the same stagnant shit every single fucking week with this guy. Cuts the same promos, has the same matches. It doesn't matter whether he's in the ring with AJ Styles or Randy Orton. If AJ Styles could not get a great match out of him a couple months back on SmackDown then the guy's not that very good. Plain and simple. And AJ has not had, if any, bad matches in WWE since he showed up a year and a half ago. But, almost exactly a year and a half ago. Uh, back in January 2016 at the Rumble. But, if he can't get a great match out of him, then there's something wrong there. And Jinder is just not good. He's just not good. So yeah, um, the matches, the only really good Jinder match I can recall from the past two, three months was the one that he had on um, Money in the Bank with, with Orton, which I thought wasn't great. It was really good. It was pretty good, a lot better than their Backlash match. Obviously, the Battleground match fucking blew. And I can name no promo he has cut, not one promo he has cut in the past two, three months that has stood out to me as special. The guy is just not good at all on the mic. And it always sounds like he's losing his voice, which I understood after he won the belt, thinking, okay, he was excited, he went crazy, blah, blah, blah. But that was two months ago, so I don't know what's wrong with his voice. Uh, or he has laryngitis, or a long-term case of it, I don't know, but if you're purely basing a grade off of matches and promos, I gotta give it a D, I'm sorry. Land of the Y, their question was, I know I've said I don't care about Mike and Maria Canellis, but I will say three positive things about Mike. One, his theme is still good. Two, the subtle detail of his attire revolving around Mike and Maria's attire, revolving around Mike and not, or, or, around, or, revolving, that's a tongue twister, the subtle detail of his attire revolving around Mike, or, oh, excuse me, the subtle detail of his attire revolving, revolving around Maria, and Maria's attire revolving around Maria and not Mike. Okay, I get what you're saying. Three, I got nothing. What's a good third thing about the guy? So here's the thing about Mike and Maria, um, specifically Mike Bennett, because it's not only now that I've seen some hate for the guy or I don't care about the guy, what's so good about him, blah, blah, blah. Because people were saying the same thing when he was in TNA. This is not a new thing. Like, oh my god, he's in TNA. He sucks. Everyone loved him in TNA. Why don't they like him now? No, there was a lot of people in TNA, a lot of TNA fans that didn't like Mike Bennett or did not see, did not get the, the hype. I mean, the guy's not a future world champion. He's just not. And I've said that before. I do like Mike Bennett, um, partially because I'm biased because I've been following the guy in his careers for the past like almost 10 years now. I would go to Northeast Wrestling Shows, which I'll mention uh, a bit later on. I think it was at E13 Emmanuel who asked about a Northeast Wrestling show. But yeah, I've been going to Northeast Wrestling now for eight years, since 2009. And Mike Bennett was on some of those early 2009 shows. And I met him before. He's a really, really cool guy. And Maria, too. I actually met him both with my, with uh, Matt Taven about two years ago. And they were both really, really cool. Almost exactly two years ago, in August of 2015. But um, yeah, I think the guy's a good worker. Really, the star of the package is Maria. And without Maria, the guy would be a jobber. But they're already making him out to be a jobber, even with Maria. I mean, he lost to Sami Zayn clean on Sunday. And then again on Tuesday, when you had, like I said earlier, you had Aiden English in that same exact tag team match. 
Why wouldn't you have him get pinned instead of Mike Kanellis? That was really, really dumb in my opinion. But, um, yeah, so I, I get why you would not be a big Mike and Maria fan. I still love the theme, too. The, the theme is great. The gimmick, dead on arrival, as someone said earlier. I understand that. But, um, just, I don't know. If they give him more creative freedom, maybe not necessarily that, but they don't stranglehold the guy. They don't pigeonhole him to one fucking stupid character about love, and they give him more of an aggressive edge as opposed to having him hide behind his wife all the time. That, that could be good. But they're not doing that. They did that once in his debut match a week ago. And now even a week later, he feels significantly less special than he did when he first arrived, let alone even a week ago. So I guess it is what it is. I mean, I, I know Johnson, when I talk to him, that he really sees him as like the SmackDown Kurt Hawkins. And that's really unfortunate. I really don't think he's on that level. I think Kurt Hawkins is good too. But they might just do that. They just might, might make the guy like a, a glorified jobber on SmackDown. And I think that sucks. I think that'd be a huge waste of Maria. Like, Mike Bennett's a big enough waste of him because I think he's better than that. But that's a huge waste of Maria because that woman is way better than that. She's a great heel. She's an awesome talker. She got over as a great character in TNA and Ring of Honor first. So to have her come in and just manage a jobber would be a complete waste. So I really hope they have more in mind for these guys than, uh, than, than what they're doing so far because it's not been very pretty so far in their run on SmackDown Live. And on SmackDown Live of all places, too. Not even on Raw. Like, I can... I can see why they'd be buried on Raw, but fuck, oh my god, it's SmackDown. And I was kind of thinking, like, why of why of anyone would these two go to NXT, or go to SmackDown before NXT? Why would they completely jump over, you know, uh, NXT and go straight to the main roster? I mean, they're no AJ Styles, so it's like, why would Mike Bennett, of all people, come to SmackDown? And I think it might be a case of Kurt Hawkins and Jinder, like John said, where... They, uh, they don't see him as a big star, but they want to bring him in as a warm body in the roster to put people over. And that would suck, but it looks like that might be the case. Otherwise, why wouldn't they put them in NXT? They only put people in NXT like Nakamura, Samoa Joe, Austin Aries, Bobby Roode, soon-to-be Adam Cole, and other people who they think will be big stars, and additionally can help sell tickets for their live shows. I'm sure no one's buying a ticket to see Mike Bennett and, or Mike Kanellis and uh, Maria Kanellis. Maybe Maria Kanellis but uh, definitely not Mike and Ellis. So that's probably why they didn't go to NXT. And it's not like, oh, Maria used to be in the company. That's why they put her on uh, SmackDown instead of NXT. Well, Drew McIntyre was too, and he's in NXT. So that's not necessarily the case. Uh, Atlanta's second question. With all due respect to John Cena, why does he have such a knack for making Rusev look bad? I have no idea. I mean, the first feud really was not that good. They had a really, really good match at Fastlane. The subsequent matches weren't quite as good. They weren't terrible. I thought they were entertaining to an extent. The match on Sunday sucked. I mean, I've said this before, and I don't want to go on a huge rant about this, but what the hell was the point of doing another Cena and Rusev feud or match or whatever to keep Cena busy? I mean, they should have just brought back the guy on Tuesday. They're, really, other than giving him a quick win over Rusev, which they could have easily done in an episode of SmackDown, which would have also been dumb because Rusev's better than this, and they just brought the guy back, and he's already losing, you know, meaningless matches. They could have just brought Cena back last night done the Nakamura thing. That would have been a lot cooler. I know Jericho returned last night too, which was also great. But they could have had Cena come back too. It could have been a, an even bigger show if they brought him back. Like, why bring him back when they did? Maybe to boost the rating for the 4th of July show. I get it. I'm not sure if that did anything to boost the rating because it was 4th of July. And obviously it's a holiday show. And those shows never get great ratings. But the whole Rusev feud is a complete waste of time. It did way more damage to Rusev than it did anything to help John Cena. So I really hope they keep those two far away from each other. It's the same thing with Bray Wyatt. And I hate the argument. I think people realize that it was a dumber argument, so they stopped saying it. That, oh, Bray Wyatt gained a lot from working with John Cena. No, he didn't. If anything, that was where Bray Wyatt's downfall began when he lost to WrestleMania 30. He lost there. Won an awful match at Extreme Rules 2014 over Cena in that steel cage. That sucked. And the payback match was the best of the three matches they had. But he lost that too. The last man standing man. He literally got buried under steel steps at the hands of John Cena. That did way more damage to Bray Wyatt than it did anything to help the guy. And I'm glad they've kept they've largely kept him apart since. So here's hoping that's the last Cena versus Rusev match we ever see. Brandon A, also from YouTube, even with WWE's bad writing and booking, who do you believe from the main roster that will eventually become a world champion? Same question for those in NXT once they go to the main roster. Very good question. I'm going to say for the from the main roster, Sami Zayn. Um, I still see people say that, 
you know, they haven't done well by him on the main roster. He's being buried, blah, 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 dude. I mean, come on. He's beaten Baron Corbin on pay-per-view. He just beat Mike Kanellis, for whatever that's worth. He was in the main event of Money in the Bank. I mean, it was a Money in the Bank ladder match, but he still headlined the show. He had a, uh, he was in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal WrestleMania, but he had that good feud with Braun Strowman, a good feud with Samoa Joe. Zayn does not have to be winning all the time. That guy's an ultimate underdog. That's his gimmick. He loses, and then when he finally wins, it means a lot more. So, again, um, the thing with Sami Zayn, I think he'll be just fine, and especially on SmackDown, if they, can, if they continue to give him direction, he could be a world champion. And like everyone's been saying, myself included, if Jinder Mahal can become a WWE champion, so can Sami Zayn. So there is still hope for Sami. All hope is not lost. He's not damaged goods. I think he will become a world champion at some point down the road. From NXT... That's a harder one. Um, like, if you said someone that was booked badly in NXT then won the NXT championship, I get that. But you're saying someone who's booked not too well and has been written badly in NXT that will eventually become a main roster, a main world, uh, a world champion on the main roster. That's a different story. That one I don't really have many answers for because someone like Andrade, okay, they haven't booked him very well. I mean, he's a great heel, but he's basically a glorified jobber. He's lost a lot more than he's won recently. But even him, I don't see him becoming a world champion in the main roster. He's not a world champion competitor, caliber competitor. He's not. He's very, very good, but he's not a future world champion. A guy like Cassius Ono, another great athlete who they really have not done a ton with. I know that he's facing or he's facing Hideo Otami or Hideo Otami tonight, and they've had their little feud, which is cool. I don't see him becoming a world, becoming a world champion in the main roster. If Cesaro has not yet become a world champion, Ono is not becoming a world champion in the main roster. If he even makes it to the main roster. Um, the only person I can think of, and he hasn't been booked badly, I think he's been booked very, very well recently in NXT, would be Roderick Strong. Um, they didn't really do all that, they didn't do too right by him in the beginning when he first showed up in NXT, he was kind of an afterthought, but ever since right after TakeOver Orlando, he's been on fire, and he, you know, he beat Sanity, he beat Eric Young, he faced Bobby Roode in an excellent match of the NXT Championship a few weeks back, and he lost, but he looked great in defeat. So I think he has a bright future ahead of him. Again, it's not a shoe and he'll become a world champion, but he's got a great look. And if they can continue along this path of booking him very, very well and making him look good in his matches, I think he could become a future world champion on the main roster. His next question here, I know you don't watch a lot of New Japan, but I'm sure you have heard of the G1 Climax and how it works. If WWE had a G1 Climax tournament, which 10 Raw guys block A and have 10 and what 10 SmackDown guys block B? would you place in the tournament, and who would you have ultimately win the whole thing? That's a great question. Um, I have not seen any of the G1. Not that I don't have interest. I know the matches are amazing. People are raving about it. New Japan's not my thing. I'm sorry. I, I watch way too much wrestling as it is, covering the stuff that, uh, I don't know, all the WWE stuff and Ring of Honor and TNA and all the other uh, Lucha Underground, you know, and all that other stuff. So I'm not going to watch the G1. I know I've heard a lot of cool things about it. Just I don't, know, I don't have much too much interest, but it does sound cool, though. But I do like the idea of doing a G1 in WWE. They would do it way worse than New Japan, I'm sure. But say they did one. These are the 20 guys I would have be a part of it. For Raw, and it's not just the, bet wor the best workers, by the way, either. Because you can't put, like, a fucking, you know, just a random jabroni in there. Um, that's a jobber, but he's a good worker. So I try to put all the biggest stars in both brands. If you would do it differently, that's fine. But here's the guys that I would put in it. From Raw, Seth Rollins is a given. Finn Balor. Samoa Joe, Roman Reigns, Braun Strowman, Dean Ambrose, The Miz, Bray Wyatt. Now, there weren't many other big stars. Like, I wouldn't put Brock Lesnar in there because you know the guy wouldn't lose and he'd have to win the whole thing. So, I wouldn't put Brock in there. But for the last two, um, I figured I would pick two random other guys. And they don't have the strongest, like, mid-card. Like, I wouldn't put Apollo Crews in there or Kalisto. Um, they're just, they just aren't that relevant. So, I put Cesaro in there and Jeff Hardy. I guess you could put Matt in there, uh, in, in there too, in, in place of Jeff. But I put in Jeff Hardy. I think he could have better matches with the other guys on the Raw block, in the Raw block, uh, block A, whatever. From SmackDown, I would put in there, obviously, AJ Styles, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Baron Corbin, Shinsuke Nakamura, Dolph Ziggler. I don't know where the hell he's been. I, I still think he's on his way out of the company, but more on that later. John Cena, which, oh my God, why would you put John Cena in the, in the, in the G1 Climax? He's the biggest star in the company, besides Brock Lesnar. He has to be in it. Dolph Ziggler, John Cena, Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, and Luke Harper. 
Uh, Jericho just came back, so I threw him in there. And Luke Harper. Um, I just needed some other random dude. And uh, Jinder Mahal would not be put in there. The guy just does nothing. I know he's the WWE champion, but he does nothing for me, so I'm sorry. So I put Luke Harper in there instead as a uh, wild card. So yeah, those are my 20 guys. I would love to know what you guys think of my 20 guys or who you would put in there instead. But uh, yeah, something like that in WWE would be really cool, but they can't do that exact same tournament because it would be very obvious they're ripping off New Japan. Uh, Jose K, also from YouTube, should Jason Jordan use the pump handle suplex as his finisher? It looks good and it's like an angle slam in a way he's done it often. I think the the the, uh, the finisher he used on Monday was good. I'm fine with what he used on Monday. I think that's not a bad idea, but uh, I like what they did there because it looked like he was going for like the back suplex, like the finisher he did, the grand amplitude finisher he did with Chad Gable, that uh, Chad would you know catch him on the way down and Jason Jordan would throw him up. He was going for that and he threw him up, but he caught him in a neck breaker on the way down. That was really really cool. That was a nice innovation off his old finisher. Uh, with Chad Gable, so I would just have him keep the one that he has now, and I, you know, giving the guy an angle slam, and you said it's a variation of the angle slam, or even the ankle lock, don't pigeonhole this guy by having him do Kurt Angle's moves, that would be really dumb, I don't think they need to go that far, I think his debut on Raw, his Raw in-ring debut on Monday was really good, uh, Jose's second question here, I know it's kind of late now, but would Braun Strowman's character have fit better if he wore a mask since he started like they did with Kane? Add the mystery to it because he's a monster and has the skill. He didn't really need a mask. I know he first showed up, like, coincidentally enough, he did debut with a mask on. On Raw that one time, the night after SummerSlam, he had the uh, black sheep mask on. But he took it off two seconds later. The guy is frightening looking. I mean, Braun Strowman, he's not ugly or anything, but he looks like a fucking badass. And his face helps with that. Like, I know the whole baby Gerber thing, he looks like a baby, he has a baby face, whatever. But he looks frightening. Beard and all. The guy looks fucking frightening. Uh, so, no, I don't think they needed to do the Kane thing with a mask. That would feel way too much like Kane. Uh, so, I'm glad they didn't do that, and I'm glad he debuted the way that he did. And his last question here, will Cesaro leave WWE soon because he's not being used properly? What other superstars might because of the same reason? I, Cesaro, maybe, but I feel like if he hasn't left now, he's never going to leave. Like, I feel like he has a good gig going for himself in WWE. And, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say that because... Cody Rhodes was in WWE for nine years, and he never got his just due. I know he was a two-time IC champion, but he never got his just due as world champion. And it came to a point after nine years where he was like, fuck this, I'm leaving. So maybe by 2021, nine years after Cesaro has debuted on the main roster, maybe then he'll leave. But, I mean, it's, it's not like he's being buried. You know what I mean? I mean, the guy is a Raw Tag Team champion right now. He has some success, and he's a former United States champion. They could be doing a lot more with him. But he's not being buried. The guy's a tag team champion. He's been put in prominent positions to succeed. Not in the main event level as the way that he should. But still, I think he's been doing quite well for himself with what he's been given. In terms of other superstars leaving because they're not getting their just due. I've seen some people say the club. I think they're they're making a lot of money. So I'd be shocked if they left to go back to gym. Not Maybe not shocked, but I could see them maybe. Uh, down the road if they don't, you know, get beyond a certain level. Because WWE really ruined a good thing there. They had a lot of momentum when they first showed up about a year ago in April of 2016. And then they fell off the face of the earth. Like, they took AJ away from them, and then they just went on to do nothing on Raw. Um, and then they, before they won the tag titles, like, way later than they should have. But then that reign was cut short, too. So, anyway, uh, I, I could see them leaving down the road, but not right now. How many times have I said this? Dolph... Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler is on his way out. I called that literally a year ago when people said, oh my god, he's going to leave after No Mercy because it's being reported that his contract's up soon. No, no, it wasn't. It really wasn't. I mean, it was reported two years ago when Ziggler first re-signed with WWE in either late July, like right, like literally right around this time, or early August, that the guy signed a two-year deal with the company. And the, con the, the contract should be up, like, any day now if it isn't already up. And I heard, I've heard nothing about it from any dirt sheets. My only speculation is, is purely based off what I think and uh, what I read two years ago about the fact that he signed a two-year deal. Now, he could have signed an extension. I'm surprised he re-signed the first time because he wasn't doing jack shit two years ago when he first re-signed. So I really do think this is it, and he's leaving soon. And I hope he does. I mean, I like Dolph Ziggler. But he has been irrelevant for such a long time. Every single time his music hits, I just roll my eyes and groan. Because you know it's not going to be anything of importance. And you know he's not going to be pushed to a top tier level. The guy's just got to go and reinvent himself elsewhere. If he wants to even continue wrestling. 
Like, he might do the stand-up comedy thing. I don't know if he can make a living doing that. But I could see him going to Japan, to Ring of Honor, like Cody did, and following in, 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 in his footsteps. So that'd be pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, Dolph Ziggler, I think, is on his way out. I said that a long time ago. And the fact he's been off TV for the past, I think, about a month now really solidifies that fact. Um, I think he was last seen in that uh, the Independence Day Battle Royal a few weeks back, and he was like the first one tossed. So, really, with with Dolph Ziggler, I think it's really only a matter of when and not if he's leaving the company. Emmanuel A. from YouTube, I read a story about a Northeast wrestling show where the then NEW champion TK Orion defended the title against a surprise opponent who turned out to be Mike Bennett. Apparently, except for a Where's Maria chant, the crowd was dead silent. Eventually, after Maria did interfere to help Mike win the title, TK Orion, a babyface, told the crowd, You all didn't come here to see a match in like this. I think we should restart it. To which a, the uh, to which the crowd said a loud, to which the crowd gave a loud no chant. Have you heard about this story? No, I have not. Um, not the way that you detailed it, anyway. I, I heard, obviously, that Mike Bennett beat TK Orion for the belt. I was going to go to that show, too. I think that was the same show. That was like NEW's WrestleMania. Pretty sure it was in Waterbury, Connecticut, because I almost went. Ryback was there. I just At that point, I'm thinking I'm not going to go because I'm already going to WrestleMania. That would be way too much. So I didn't go. But it was a great show from what I heard. Mike Bennett did show up. It was right after he left TNA. So it would have been a pretty big deal for him to come in and win the belt. And Mike Bennett had been wrestling for NEW for like, he's been with them for almost a decade now. So fans know him. So maybe that's why it wasn't a big surprise. Um, or maybe not a big surprise, but uh, rather that uh, it, it wasn't like a huge deal. It's not like Cody Rhodes, you know, answering the open challenge and the first time he's been in NEW. Like Mike Bennett had been there for such a long time. He was wrestling with NEW while he was with TNA. There were a few shows that I went to last summer that he was at. Um, even while he was still with TNA. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, but I did hear about that he won the belt, and then two weeks later he dropped the belt to Cody. And Cody's been champion ever since, because I think Mike obviously got wind of the fact he was headed to WWE, which is why he dropped the belt. So, uh, no, I have not heard that story. I was going to go to that show. I did not, so maybe I'll check it out. I know Northeast Wrestling sells DVDs of all their shows. I might have to buy that show, not only for that match and to see what you're talking about, but also the Kurt Angle, Cody Rhodes, Steel Cage main event which I heard was phenomenal. Moving now into the Twitter questions, at Carson Rush 2, Carson Rush, excuse me, 2, uh, from Twitter, what are your thoughts on reports of another potential superstar shakeup after SummerSlam? No. No, 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 no. I really, really hope not. First of all, the super, the first superstar shakeup that I talked about earlier, that happened back in April, didn't kill SmackDown, but it ensured that Raw got more talent. The Miz, who was killing it on SmackDown, got drafted to Raw. Alexa Bliss, killing it on SmackDown, really revolutionized the women's division on that brand. Drafted a Raw. Even Bray Wyatt, the former WWE champion, went to Raw. You know, so I, I really hope not. Maybe they want to do another one just to get people from Raw back on SmackDown because they know they're not working at Raw. I mean, The Miz is the Intercontinental Champion, but uh, I think they know that he would be better off on SmackDown. But no, I haven't heard that rumor. You're, you're the first one to break that news to me. I have not heard any legitimate you know, uh, claims or speculation from any real sources, that might be the case. So I'm hoping it's not true and it's just pure fan speculation or pure, pure fan fantasy booking or something. Just because we don't need another one. We literally just had one three months ago and it did, you know, we're, we're worse off because of it. The rosters are worse off because of that superstar shakeup. So I hope it's not true. Do one a year and that's it. Do it once a year, right after WrestleMania, and that's it. Next question from at, at no ODB allowed. Uh, what can the WWE do to get fans to care about 205 Live? First of all, as I've said a million times, you got to axe the live aspect of the show. The crowds don't care. By and large, they don't care. You got to move it to Full Sail University. And uh, I don't care if you want to do it live. But the thing if you don't do it live is that you have, you know, they have the crossover there with, with Raw. So if you tape a month's worth of content that's already been taped, and you're doing other stuff on Raw, which is live. It just doesn't really work out. But I guess I don't know what their their cost is or what the Full Sail University Arena is being used for when NXT is not there. I'm not really sure. But it would be cool if they filmed 205 Live live or just you know film the show without being it live. It doesn't have to be live. Uh, they filmed it at a Full Sail because at least the crowds there know these wrestlers and. 
I don't know. I feel like it's very WWE produced. That's the biggest problem with this show. They had a great main event last night, I thought. Cedric Alexander and Rich Swan versus Tony Nese and TJP. Really, really fun tag team match. Uh, wasn't quite as limited in terms of, as they usually are in terms of in-ring stuff and feeling like a WWE match that's very slow-paced. It was early on, but they really picked up the pace down the stretch. And it was one of the more entertaining Cruiserweight matches I've seen in recent memory on TV, not including pay-per-views and stuff. So, that's one thing. Have the show be taped at a full sale or have it air before SmackDown. Tape it before SmackDown because doing it after SmackDown has killed the fucking show. Um, and also, obviously, to have people, to have the guys of 205 Live interact with other members of the roster. And I know the mindset, like, oh, why would they be able to be the heavyweight? They're below them. Like, that's not always the case. Rey Mysterio was, was beating heavyweights. The guy was beating the Great Golly and Big Show on certain occasions. So, it's not the most unbelievable thing to think that a cruiserweight could beat, not even a giant, but like, you know, a Miz or like a Bo Dallas or a Curtis Axel, you know? So, that that's another thing I would do. Not have them pigeonhole to their own division. You have to have them interact with other members of the roster because it just gets old after a while. Seeing the same guys have the same matches and do the same thing every single week is, you know, it gets to a point where people just don't care. And it already has gotten to a point where people don't care. At RJ underscore Marso, my brother RJ's question was, we've agreed that Elias Sampson has been handled so much better on Raw. What has contributed to that? You know, I was thinking about the same thing. I wrote a whole article about this, I think two weeks ago. For hidden remote, so check it out when you can. G plug. Um, you know, obviously being given direction on Raw has helped. He had the feud with Dean Ambrose and now with Finn Balor. I think he won both feuds. I'm pretty sure he beat Dean Ambrose um, a few months back, and he just beat Finn Balor. That's that. Those are two former WWE champions right there, and it's weird. I mean, you'll have crowds like in NXT that just the smarky fans that reject the fucking singing shit. I didn't think it was great, and they've they've had him do it a lot less on the main roster. But the way they brought him in by having him float around on Raw, having him drift around Raw was really, really cool, I thought. I thought that was great. And um, the matches aren't too bad. He's being put in the ring with actually, you know, good superstars and Dean Ambrose and Finn Balor where he can. He's being put in a, in a, in a position to succeed. And NXT, because there was so much star power down there, and you, you have star power on the main roster too, obviously, even more so than out in NXT. But there was more spots for people to succeed. Like with Elias Samson... If he won a feud against Apollo Crews in NXT, then what's next for him? You know what I mean? If he's going to beat Oni Larkin, then then who cares? Like, what is he going to do after that? Go after the title? Like, the guy's not a threat. Um, I don't think he's ever going to be a world champion, but they have used him really, really well on the main roster. And, um, yeah, maybe he's a future mid-card champion, you know, a la Jeff Jarrett. The guy was never that great. You know, Jeff Jarrett was never world champion material, despite how many world titles he won between WCW and TNA. But the guy was all right. And uh, he was very, very good as IC champion in WWE. So maybe Samson falls into that category too. But yeah, I think the fact that they've given him more direction on Raw, given him more promo time on Raw, giving him more matches on Raw. Like in NXT, the guy would win a few matches against Jobbers, and then he would lose to the Finn Balors, the the Drew McIntyres, the this guy, the that guy, the, the Samoa Joes and whatever. He was always losing, so therefore he didn't care about the guy. So, uh, yeah, I'm really glad to see Elias and Sampson succeed. Um, I think I've been, I've really been, he's not my favorite act on Raw, but they've done well by him. On Raw, too, not even SmackDown. So, uh, two thumbs up for the great usage of Elias Sampson on, on, on Raw. I think it's been great. And it's very rare, too, that you have someone that's not used all that well in NXT, and then they succeed on the main roster. I think the only three people that come to mind are Sampson, absolutely Alexa Bliss, who was never anything in NXT, really. Um, I mean, she was she was great in NXT, but they never gave her a shot to go after the title. Same thing with Carmella, who's also been really, really good in the main roster as a heel. So, I think those three people are prime examples of superstars that have benefited more on the main roster, have benefited more from being in the main roster than they ever were in NXT. Which, again, is rare, but there are, uh, you know, examples that it could happen. At Scarlet Once, got two questions here. First one being, have you ever seen Botchamania? Of course, everyone knows Botchamania. I don't follow it every single week. I don't watch every episode. I'm not subscribed to the millions of channels this guy has. Matthew, Greg, or whatever his name is. But I have seen the show. It's very funny. I commend the work that goes into it. It seems like a lot of shit goes in. Like, I can only imagine how much time it takes to get all these clips and to avoid copyright and all that other stuff. It's a great show. I don't watch it religiously, but I have seen it. It's very entertaining. 
And their second question, how do you feel about Chad Gable's heel turn on Smack Talk, or smack, Smacking Talk, uh, you said Smack Talk, but it's Smacking Talk, where he refused Daniel Bryan as a father. Uh, that was wonderful. If you haven't already seen it, be sure to go out of your way to check it out. Daniel Bryan, it was supposed to be on Tout, it was not. Tout delivers 15 30 second videos, people. They're not, they're not, it's not YouTube. So Daniel Bryan put up the first official episode, the unofficial official episode of Smacking Talk, which is a tongue twister because I'm so conditioned and programmed to say talking smack. But they put up the first episode of uh, Smacking Talk last night after SmackDown on his Twitter, and it's amazing. For a, for a two-minute and 25-second video, it's hilarious. Chad Gable and Daniel Bryan had this great banter together about whether Chad Gable's Daniel Bryan's son and all this other stuff, and Renee Young is awesome as always. It's a lot of fun. It really makes me miss talking smack. But uh, check it out when you can. I hope we get more episodes like that on uh, on Tout in the future of uh, Smacking Talk. Next question from at E13A. Did you notice this sound? So Emmanuel linked me to a GIF from uh, at GIFDDT or at DDTGIF or whatever his Twitter username is. Of uh, Jinder Mahal making this weird... I'm not even going to attempt to recreate it. Making this weird yelp sound. This weird yelling sound. Uh, during the Punjabi prison match on Sunday. Very Brock Lesnar-esque. Like if you've seen those memes and gifs of uh, Brock Lesnar going... Or whatever the fuck it is. I can't even do it. Which is even more bizarre considering he looks like a, an animal. But he sounds like a, you know, a, a dead horse or something. When he does stuff like that. But I didn't notice... Actually I didn't notice that. I was so... I was so trying to not pay attention to that match and how bad it was. I tuned out a lot of what I saw, including that probably. So that was my first time hearing that. And it's just, it, it's it's weird. It's something else. It's something that has to be heard to be believed. It's it's strange for a guy like Jinder Mahal. Anyway, um, his second question. A couple of people have claimed that Nakamura's WWE matches have been underwhelming. Will the Cena match break that trend? I could see why people would say they've been underwhelming. I think they've been pretty, not great. I mean, not like the level that you would expect from him from New Japan, in New Japan, but but even in NXT, I mean, Nakamura wasn't having like amazing matches every single week, people. Like he was, name one TV match other than the match with Finn Balor. That was like great. You can't name a single one because the guy was at rarely ever in NXT TV, which might be for the better. But, uh, I don't know, just with Nakamura and his WWE matches, the first, ma the first match with Ziggler was pretty good. I know underst I understand why people would be saying that, oh, he should have dominated Ziggler or whatever. They had another really good rematch on SmackDown after Money in the Bank um, about a month or so ago. I thought the match with Corbin on Tuesday was a lot better than the one they had at Battleground. So the matches haven't been that bad. He had a decent match with Kevin Owens a while ago on SmackDown, so I can see why they would be, like, underwhelming in that respect, but they haven't been bad, so people are just overreacting. That said, I do expect the Cena match to break that trend next Tuesday. First of all, how dumb is it that they're doing the match in the first place on free TV? They're giving away this, as they even mentioned themselves, a dream match on free fucking television next week. I know they're advertising it a week in advance, and that's great, but, like, that's a match best saved for SummerSlam or Royal Rumble or WrestleMania or whatever. But they're doing it next week on the show, so maybe it never gets started. Maybe it has a non-finish. But still, the fact you're doing it at all eliminates that first time ever possibility for a future pay-per-view. But I expect the match to be really good. I'd be pissed if Nakamura lost either clean or got pinned at all by John Cena because Nakamura should not be losing at this point. That would be really fucking stupid. For a Cena-Mahal match at SummerSlam, how ass-backwards is that? I mean, as Solomonster pointed out on Twitter, and I was thinking too, like, the real main event at SummerSlam, what you would think would be Cena Nakamura. Why would they be building to Cena Mahal by doing Cena Nakamura on TV? That's like the exact equivalent to Cena and Punk on Raw, and then Cena and Rock at WrestleMania. The match that no one wanted to see is being set up with a match that everyone wanted to see at WrestleMania between Cena and Punk. Same exact thing. So, I would be surprised if Cena Nakamura did not have a very good match next week, especially considering how big the circumstances and the implications of that match are in regards to SummerSlam. At Rusty Rages, on a scale from 1 to 10, how disappointing do you think SummerSlam will be? You know what? It's hard for it to be disappointing when the hype isn't really there. Like, I look at the card that we're probably going to get, and I'm just not excited. Naomi Natalia? Nah. Cena Mahal? Pfft. 
Who cares? Um, I mean, maybe like Ambrose and, and Rollins versus Sheamus and Cesaro could be pretty good. Uh, Hardy's Revival I would like, but Bliss and Alexa I like, but it's like we've seen the match before. I'm not like extremely excited for it. We've seen it before. The only match I'm really looking forward to that I feel has that SummerSlam worthy feel is the, hopefully the main event, Brock, Joe, Strowman, and Reigns, which should be amazing. The brawl on Monday's Raw was tremendous. So that match should be really, really good. So it's hard to call a show, it's really hard to call a show disappointing when your hype level isn't through the roof. Like last year's show, I could see why people would call it, would call it disappointing because it had this great build, had a lot of big dream matches, a lot of big marquee matches, and the show overall fell flat, especially towards the end. So I could see why that would be disappointing, but it's hard to be disappointed by a show that you know is probably going to be not that great to begin with. So um, I, I'm going to say just the six, just because of my hype level is not through the roof. And it's not because I'm not going this year. It's just because the card isn't that great. So of the three Summer Slams I've been to in Brooklyn, if I had to choose one not to go to, it would be the one coming up, which I'm not going to anyway. Um, not because the card isn't good, but because I'm going away that weekend anyway to go see my girlfriend. So I can't go regardless. So, but I won't be watching live. I'll be coming home that Sunday night. So I'm, I'm not really that mad about not being able to watch it live. His next question, who's been the MVP at the midway point of the year for WWE, uh, in WWE for Raw, SmackDown Live, and NXT. So three different MVPs here. For Raw, it's definitely a tie between Braun Strowman and Samoa Joe. Uh, Braun Strowman, every single time the guy comes out or returns or whatever, gets a big pop because people love fucking Braun Strowman. That's like that that came out really, really wrong. That people love fucking Braun Strowman. People fucking love Braun Strowman is what I should have said. Excuse me. Not gonna edit that out. I'm gonna leave that in there. Uh Strowman has been a huge asset to Monday Night Raw. And the time that he was gone, Raw wasn't that good. And when he came back, all of a sudden Raw starts to get good again. So Strowman's been a huge MVP M MVP for Raw, as well as Samoa Joe. Um, Samoa Joe, since he got called up back in January, has been a huge asset to Raw. And the feuds he had with Seth Rollins, Sami Zayn, Brock Lesnar, absolutely. The matches he's had on TV with Jericho and Cesaro and Rollins and people like that, Roman Reigns. Joe's been a big asset to Raw, so I'm going to say it's a tie between Samoa Joe and Braun Strowman. For SmackDown, the most valuable player for the blue brand absolutely is AJ Styles. Without AJ Styles, that show would blow even more than it already does at some weeks. Uh, than it does sometimes. AJ Styles is, you know, he's not on the top of the world like he was in 2016 because he's not been the WWE title picture since Elimination Chamber. But the US title stuff's been pretty entertaining. And, um, yeah, he's been great for SmackDown. So absolutely AJ Styles. For NXT, it's hard to say, to a lesser extent, at least to the NXT TV shows, Orny Larkin. Orny Larkin has been great. The matches he's had with um, Drew McIntyre, Cassius Ono, I want to say, Hideo Itami, have been awesome. The Danny Burch match he had last week was also really, really good. On a bigger scale, Bobby Roode. Like, I don't think anyone else has meant that much to NXT this year than Bobby Roode as champion. Um, I mean, not even the matches he's had. Like, the matches he's had with Nakamura and Hideo Itami were really, really good. But just the presence he brings as champion, he feels like a star. He is the biggest star on that brand without Nakamura, without Nakamura being there, without you know, with Nakamura being called up. So absolutely, Bobby Roode. But to a lesser to a lesser extent, Oni Larkin, uh, AJ Styles for SmackDown, like I said, in a tie between Braun Strowman and Samoa Joe for Raw, like I said earlier. And his last question here: After watching SmackDown live in Battleground. Does it seem like WWE is burying Mike Kanellis to you as well? Again, I don't want to say burying, but I kind of got my thoughts on this out of the way earlier. They're just not doing him any favors. It really does not seem like anyone in the SmackDown creative team is a big fan or even saw the work of Mike Bennett and TNA. Um, because they have to know how good the guy is. He's not great, but he's good enough to the point where having Maria as his manager should make him a star. I mean, the fact that... Okay. Let's make this quite clear. Mike Kanellis is not the most amazing. He's not the most amazing in-ring worker. He's not great in the mic, but he's got a great. <laughs> I don't want to say great package. They, they they got a great thing going with Maria. Is what I meant to say. A great package deal with Maria and Mike. But who does that sound like? What what does that sound like? Oh, what was I just saying? Oh, Jinder fucking Mahal. The guy's just mediocre as beyond. Even more mediocre in the ring than Mike Kanellis. Even more mediocre on the mic than Mike Kanellis. But he's got a great 
act going with the Singh brothers. Exactly the same thing as Mike uh, Kanellis, except for the love stuff, which I do agree is kind of a, uh, you know, does scream undercard. But beyond that, same exact thing. Yet Jinder Mahal is the WWE champion. But the only difference being that the, uh, you know, he's the evil foreigner and I must uh, hold the WWE title because you boo me because I'm Indian. Boo. Like, that's the only real difference. If Jinder Mahal could carry a show, and he doesn't, but in WWE's eyes, if he could carry a show as the WWE champion in headline pay-per-views, why not Mike Kanellis? So, that that's my two cents on Mike Kanellis. I think he could be a lot more than what he's been given so far. I don't know if I would scratch the love thing altogether, even though it's not doing him any favors, but they could make it work if they portray it the right way. But just so far, it's been... just the f It's not even the gimmick, it's the fact he lost twice. He lost clean on Monday or on Sunday at Battleground with a finisher, too, from Sammy. It's not like he got rolled up or counted out or DQ'd or whatever. He just got pinned clean one, two, three. And then on Tuesday SmackDown, like I've already said, he got pinned twice. He got he got pinned again, twice again by uh, Sami Zayn in the tag team match, which also involved Aiden English. So they're not burying him, but they're absolutely doing him no favors. Final two questions. First one coming from at Justin. I am Justin Hill. Um, his question was, could Baron Corbin cash in his money in the bank on John Cena at SummerSlam? Maybe, but I would hope not. I don't. I still don't think it's the right time to put the title on Baron Corbin. I think he still needs more seasoning, more time to come into his own as champion. So I'm going to say no. And also because I think Carmella's cashing in on that show too. So why would you have two Money in the Bank cash-ins? We've already had like two or three SummerSlam cash-ins, um, you know, Money in the Bank cash-ins at SummerSlam in the past. So why would you have two in the same night? With uh, I, I would rather have Carmella cash in. She's not amazingly ready either to be champion, but you know, I think the the pop that she would get in SummerSlam in Brooklyn at SummerSlam and you know in her home state of New York would be pretty cool. So I'm gonna say Carmella. Uh, for that, and uh, but Baron Corbin, no, I would have him cash in towards the end of the year, if not in early 2018. But I think having him cash in on John Cena though would be optimal, um, just because I think those two could have a good feud. It's a fresh feud, and having Baron Corbin go over John Cena a few times could uh, do him some good, or it could do him a lot of harm too if they have him lose to John Cena and they make him look weak. So it could go either way. Final question from Matt. It's the King underscore 23. From Jalen, uh, what are your top five favorite pay-per-views or top five pay-per-views since the brand split, including the big four events? So not favorite, just top pay-per-views in general. I might be writing an article about this, believe it or not, pretty soon because I was thinking about this the other day. I put a whole list together of top five best and top five worst. So I'm just going to rip it right from my article or what would be the article. Um, at number five, maybe I'm biased, but WrestleMania 33. I thought it was a really, really good show. One of the best WrestleManias in the last 10 years, I thought. Again, putting my experience of WrestleMania aside, uh, me being there aside, I thought it was a great show. Not the most amazing WrestleMania ever, but overall, great show, I thought. So I got to put WrestleMania on there. Definitely, I mean, Royal Rumble was a pretty damn good show, too. And you had two great title matches with uh, Owens and, and Reigns, and then Cena and AJ. The rest of the card I don't really remember all that well. I know you had like Bailey and Charlotte who had a good match, who've had better matches, but it was good. The Rumble match wasn't great. The Rumble match is pretty dull, so that's why I don't think of Royal Rumble being this great pay-per-view. It, it was kind of dull. Uh, Survivor Series bored me to tears, and SummerSlam I was also there for that one, and that was a that was a pretty good show up until like the halfway mark when it really started to drag, and you had Ziggler and Ambrose, which no one cared about. The Club and New Day, which was just horrendously booked and the main event between Brock and Orton which sent people home on a very sour note so yeah those are my uh top five pay-per-views uh or that I know sorry for the that's the big four so uh, coming in at number five it's uh Wrestlemania 33 coming in at number four Great Balls of Fire I thought was a great show definitely the best raw pay-per-view since the brand split payback was pretty good too but loved Great Balls of Fire and then the top three are the final, and the only SmackDown shows that uh, SmackDown had in 2016, almost like 2013. The top three shows they have on here since the brand split are the top three SmackDown shows in 2016. Uh, number three, No Mercy. Number two, Backlash. And number one, TLC. I thought those three consecutive pay-per-views were all fucking awesome. They all had something special to offer. They were a breath of fresh air compared to the Raw pay-per-views. 
And they all had some great main events. And No Mercy had Cena, Ambrose, and AJ. It had Ziggler and Miz. I put it number three because it had Orton and Wyatt as the main event, which was fine, but it was not good. And Wyatt at least won. Um, Backlash, you had AJ and Ambrose with AJ winning the belt. You had new SmackDown Tag Team Champs, new SmackDown Women's Champ. You had Miz and Ambrose, or Miz and, uh, excuse me, Miz and Ziggler, which was a really good match. Then TLC, I thought was, if not one of it, but I I thought it was the best pay-per-view all year. Um, I thought it was a great show with a tremendous main event, a great ladder match, new tag team champions, uh, a really, really good show, two really good women's matches. So yeah, over on the whole, I thought that was an awesome pay-per-view. So again, top five best pay-per-views since the brand split a year ago. WrestleMania 33, number five, number four, Great Balls of Fire, number three, No Mercy, number two, Backlash. I'm sorry, Backlash 2016. We've had two back two Backlashes. Backlash 2016. Backlash 2017 was... It was alright. It wasn't a great show, but it was alright. And then number one, TLC 2016. So that's it, guys. That is it for Hashtag Ask You Sim here today, episode 191 for July 26th, 2017. So thank you for sending your questions. As always, let's check out the time on the show. Just about an hour. I'm finishing this up at an hour exactly, so uh, not too much longer than the normal episodes you've done recently. I know the episodes with John and Jason went over an hour, but when you have two people talking, they're bound to go over, you know, go over an hour. So we'll probably have on our next guest. I mean, we might have on Jason again before episode 200. That's almost a given because I love hanging out with Jason. We hang out all the time. We just hung out fucking on Monday, so I'm sure we'll have him on the show again before the end of the summer, and John too, probably too as well. I always enjoy having him on too. But uh, in the meantime, in the between time, guys, you can send in your questions by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a comment on the post I put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And drop a comment on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So that being said, guys, we will be in the month of August starting next week. That is crazy to think about. Uh, 2017 is already halfway over, which just blows my mind. Um, But it's been a great month. It's been a great year. Looking forward to the remainder of 2017. And as always, guys, thank you for checking out the show. Thoroughly appreciate it. Show your uh, support for the show by liking this video, dropping a comment, with or without a question. You can just say good video, whatever, or a bad video if you thought so as well. Or, uh, you know, also share the video and subscribe to the channel. All that stuff means the world, so thank you for that. Enjoy the rest of your week, guys. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.